The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows His handiwork. Day unto day utters speech and night unto night reveals knowledge. There's no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. Heavenly Father, we're struck by the fact that even the creation shouts Your praise. Dear Lord, we pray that You would teach us to raise our voice in praise. But in addition to the creation, we also have Your Word. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold. Yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than the honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. Dear Lord, as we look out at the physical creation, we look out at the stars, we see the very signature of God. Heavenly Father, we see the magnificence, and yet in spite of it, we in so many cases are, are unimpressed. How could that be? Dear Lord, as we stop to think about the fact that You've designed every molecule of our body. Heavenly Father, I pray that You would open our eyes to see what You see, what is real. Lord, that You alone are are God. There is no other. Oh Lord, may our hearts be lifted to You in praise and worship today. Father, may we, for a moment, as we gather here today, lay aside our earthly concerns and fix our attention on You, Almighty God. And then, Father, to realize that You've given to us this book, Your Holy Word. Your Word not only prepares us for this life, but for eternity. Dear Lord, we want to thank You today. And this morning as we gather, we pray, Father, that You would would guide Your servant who presents the message of Your Word, Father. Oh God, that You would work powerfully, but not only in Your servant, but Father, also in everyone who's here this morning. I pray that You would open our hearts to receive the message of Your heart. This book is not some dead book. This is not some ancient book. This is Your Word. It's living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Oh, Heavenly Father, we pray indeed that You would use it to pierce to the very thoughts and intentions of our hearts today. Father, open our hearts to receive the message of Your heart. And may we come to value and treasure this most priceless book that You've put in our hands. Father, thank You for the privilege that's ours to be here today. And we pray that You would guide our time of worship. May it be pleasing to You. Thank You, Father. We love You in Jesus' name. Amen.
sacrifices of thanksgiving, and we offer up to you the sacrifices of love, and we offer up to you the sacrifices.
Father, for the, the privilege it's ours to, to know You. Lord, as we think about people, groups, nations, families, tribes all over the world that yet do not know Christ, and You have seen fit in Your mercy and grace to reveal Yourself to us. And Father, You've given to us this book. Oh God, forgive us for taking it lightly, for taking it for granted. Forgive us for being casual about Your Word. Thank You, Father, for the privilege that's ours this morning to open Your Word together. And I pray, Father, in a corresponding way, You would open our hearts to receive it. Thank You, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm, I'm amused by uh, all the slogans going around. And the fact of the matter is that we find out that both political campaigns are telling us this is the most important election of our lifetime. I'm sure glad to know they agree on something. That's probably the extent of it. But one thing we do know is elections have consequences. And uh, they've been telling us that for a long time, and we know it's true. For one thing we know is that three Supreme Court justices tell us that elections have consequences. And uh, so we're, we're, we're grateful for that, and, and we pray that, that God will give us wisdom to vote. Sometimes as Christians, we've been maybe guilty in the past to be negligent with regard to voting and say, well, I want to live in California. It doesn't make much difference, and that would be a shame on us. Um, it is important, but you know what, the, the, and, and please go vote if you haven't already, but I want to say something, that, that there's an election that we participate in every day of our lives that is far more important, it's the election with regard to what we do with this book. And there are many of us as Christians who seem to have an attitude that just like the elections for a president, maybe it doesn't matter that much, it matters. This morning in Sunday school from the book of Jeremiah, totally different passage than what we look at now, we discovered that the, this book, obedience to this book, matters for our lifetime. But today, now in, in this service from the book of Acts, we find that it matters not only for our lifetime, it matters for eternity. What we do with this book matters. And we need to really think about that today and, and and God has put this on my heart to challenge myself and to challenge all of us to get a lot more serious about what we do with this book. Because it matters not only for us, it matters for everyone around us. How we relate to this book, what we do with this book matters in our lifetime and it matters for eternity. And so uh, two weeks ago we saw in Acts chapter 13, the Apostle Paul shared his message in a synagogue in Pisidian Antioch. And we have the, the message recorded for us. Pretty interesting. We don't have very many of Paul's messages, but we have that one. We have one in Athens, of course. But um, So in Acts 13, we have that message. But um, the message is one thing, but the response to the message is another. So two weeks ago, we looked at the message that Paul shared, but today we look at the response. How did people respond? They didn't all respond the same way. They responded differently to that message. Now, it needs to be noted uh, that, that, of course, the New Testament didn't exist yet at this time, hadn't been written. But the Apostle Paul, in presenting Jesus as Messiah, resorted to the Old Testament. He wasn't just winging it. He wasn't just going on what he knew of Christ. He resorted to the Old Testament Scriptures to prove that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, so that when these people in the synagogue responded to Paul's message, they were responding to God's Word. And that's important. And so our theme this morning, what we do with God's Word matters forever. Not just for a week or a month, it matters forever. And we want to see five responses from these people at the synagogue. There were Jewish people in the synagogue, of course, we would expect that. And there were Gentile proselytes who were interested in the God of the Old Testament, interested in the God of the Jews, 
And so they went to the synagogue, believing that there was something special for them there. And on this particular Sabbath day, here comes Paul and Barnabas, and Paul is given an opportunity to speak. And I think that was the first mistake of the, of the rulers of the synagogue because he didn't miss it. <laughs> he went right for it. But as he presents that message, he presents a message that Jesus Christ, Yeshua, is the Messiah. And it prompted certain response. And the first response that we're going to see today is the response of the Jewish uh, people there that were part of the synagogue, the people that were used to going to the synagogue every Sabbath, and they were used to hearing the Word of God on a regular basis. And surprisingly, their, their response, the first response, is one of indifference. Indifference is uh, kind of a strange response when it comes to God's Word. So we read in Acts 13, 40-41, Paul, finishing his sermon, recognizing already the indifference in his Jewish listeners, says, Beware, therefore, lest what has been spoken in the prophets come upon you. Behold, you despisers, marvel and perish. Can you imagine coming so close to the gospel that you hear it, know about it, and walk away and refuse it and, 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 and end up passing eternity in hell because you rejected it? Behold, you despisers, marvel and perish, for I work of a work in your days, a work which you will by no means believe, though one were to declare it to you. And there is Paul declaring it to them. He is at the very moment he speaks, fulfilling the prophecy that he's reading from the Old Testament. Wow. Indifference, first response. Now, indifference, by the way, is a, a very useful response. I use it on a daily basis. Every time I get a robocall, I, I use a little healthy indifference. Really, I'm not too interested. You know, I, I do a very quiet hello, and sometimes that won't even trip their little their little mechanisms. You know, and then I just hang up. Or sometimes, you know, hi, this is Amanda, and I'm here to talk. To Sorry, indifference kicks in, and but indifference in a way is sort of a non-response, isn't it? But when it comes to God's word, really indifference. I mean. I mean, we, we are bombarded with information every day, aren't we? And some of it, quite frankly, indifference is the best way to go. But when it comes to God's Word, when it comes to the message of His Word and, and what's on His heart to share with us, indifference ought not be one of our responses. Indifference or apathy or half-heartedness or passivity. None of those seem to fit together in the same sentence with indifference. And yet that's exactly what was going on with the Jewish people in Antioch. They didn't start openly hostile. I mean, they even offered Paul the opportunity to preach, so he did. But their response was indifference. They're just their response, and he could see it on their faces, and that's why he, he used the quotation from the prophet about it. He said, you guys don't have any interest at all. Now, in their book, in Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, we read, Blessed, happy is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of the sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. Now, I know this is so Old Testament, right? This is so the book of Psalms. And, but I want to ask you something this morning. What is your response to the Word of God? Can, can you honestly, truthfully say that your heartfelt response to God's Word is a response of delight? You find delight? Delight in the law of the Lord? Blessed is the man who, who's not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the, seat of the, in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. In his law, he meditates day and night. I don't know about these, these Jewish people at the, at, the, at the synagogue in Antioch, but I suspect that they were probably a lot like many um, Baptists or Christians today. They went to the synagogue, they, they, they endured the, the, the reading of Scripture, they go, okay, yeah, yeah, I get it, I get it. But delight in the law, of, delight in God's Word, well, that might be a little much of a stretch. But this is what God intended for His people, that we would delight in His Word, that we would recognize in His Word, this is something special. He says, He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of waters. Boom! That brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever He does shall prosper. God's Word is, is, is powerful. 
And, and what we do with God's word matters and how we respond to God's word. Have we discovered the delight of the law of the Lord? Have we discovered joy and satisfaction in reading God's word? Or do we read it like it's a check it off? I did my responsibility for the day or the week or whatever. Listen, this word, this book is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Isn't that what it says in Hebrews? The word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Listen, as Christians, we don't need a psychologist or a psychiatrist because we have God's word. This word opens our hearts to us deeper than any guy that can put you on a couch. This word is powerful. God's word is powerful. It's effective. And it reaches the deepest needs of our hearts and it opens up to us things within us that we didn't even realize. I, I just wonder how many Christians have discovered the awesome power of God's word. Because what we do with God's word matters. Every day we are voting with regards to God's word. And, and, and sadly, one way we vote is the vote of indifference, of saying, well, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll catch it tomorrow. Well, you know, it's, it's been a busy day. I'll, you know, I, I'm really tired. I'll, I'll, I'll get up extra early tomorrow and we sleep in. And it's indifference. That was the response of these Jewish people, and Paul could see that response on their face. But there's another response. Well, before we do, I'll talk about this. In, in Clear back in the book of Deuteronomy, do, Hear, O Israel... The Lord spoke through Moses. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Did you ever think about that? That's, that's the Shema, the famous Hebrew, you know, that they were all to know. That, you, you, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Did you ever try to do that? Say, is that realistic? Ah, that's, that's, that's probably not realistic. Well, indeed, it, 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 it certainly is not realistic for most, even for, sadly, for many Christians. And yet, that is what God asks us to do. Is God being uh, selfish? No, because He knows that when we are correctly related to Him, it's going to make everything else come together. And, and, and so He says, and these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. Now, I don't know how many of the children of Israel, when they were walking through the desert, 40 years in the desert, and then crossing into the promise, land, I don't think any of them had a nice Bible like I got. I don't know if they had um, pieces of, of parchment that they had. You know, it, I suppose it depended on how bad you want it. Because if, if uh, Tim Mahoney in his, in his uh, videos about the Exodus is right, it's very possible that God designed the Hebrew language as the first alphabetic language ever not that long before, exactly for the purpose so that the people could have their own copies, maybe not of the whole thing, but at least of this, so that they could jot right down and then they could... Because look what he says, and these words which I command you today shall be in your heart, fine, you shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand. Well... If you're going to have a written thing, that means they knew how to read and write. And, and you're going to bind them. They should be, be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house. They weren't just scribbling. So, so God, from the beginning of the children of Israel, is trying to persuade them of the importance of this book. What we do with this book matters. And if it mattered for them, it matters for us. It matters in our lifetime, and it matters forever. And indifference just doesn't fit in the same sentence as God's Word. Not for those of us who know the truth. But secondly, we find another response. It's quite different. This response, primarily from the Gentiles who were there at that synagogue when Paul preached. I call it hunger for lack of, of, of a better word. Obviously, that's a, a, a metaphor. Hunger of what? Of, of a desire. I think a hunger pretty well captures our attention. And he says, so when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. So sometimes when I'm standing at the back door, people come out and say, Pastor, please, please, speak it again. Tell us more. <laughs> oh, thank you. That was great. Can you imagine? 
they were, had such a hunger for God's word because they, they say, wait, what did you say? You're telling us that, 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 that Jesus that was crucified rose again and he is the Messiah and he's the hope not only for the Jewish nation but for Gentiles as well? Yes, we want to hear more. Yeah, Pastor, well, you know, I, you know I, I, I've known that for 60 years. Wow! Is there, is, should we get to a point where God's Word gets stale? Is it like an old cracker? Wow, this is God's Word. It's, it's, it's living and powerful and, and hunger. That was, that was their, I, I don't know how else to describe it, that was their response. The Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. And when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. Hunger. Wow, they were, they were intrigued and fascinated and they wanted to know more about, about who this God is and His Word. Wow, what, a, what, a, what an amazing difference of response. If I'm not mistaken, Paul was just one person. I don't think he had a separate session for the Gentiles and a separate section, section for the Jews. He stood in the synagogue and he presented one message, but look at the difference in the responses. One group, eh. and the other group, whoa, we want more. That's, that's really worth thinking about, isn't it? How is it possible that the same message would resonate so powerfully in one group and not so powerfully in another group? Hmm. This morning in Sunday school, we, I mentioned this little quote, which I found, found so interesting. Faith is the spiritual sense by which a person recognizes and accepts the revelation of God and a spiritual consciousness awakened by that revelation. Faith is a spiritual sense. And I mentioned in the science school class, I'll mention it again because I'm still trying to get this down. We have the sense of sight, we have a sense of hearing, but our eye cannot see what our ear hears. I mean, unless the two things happen at the same time and we see uh, somebody hit a drum, but you can't... you you. you your eye cannot hear sound waves. Your ear has to hear them. And your nose picks up smell, fragrances. So your ear can't hear fragrances and your eye can't see fragrances. You have to have your nose for that. So we have these five senses that we have. And we know all about the five senses. He's telling us there's a sixth sense. And the sixth sense is faith. And it has to do with God's Word. And when we have this sixth sense. We hear God's Word and something happens and it resonates in our heart. Just like a sound wave resonates in my ear. Just like a light wave resonates from my eye. So in a very similar sense, God's Word resonates in our hearts by faith. It's, it's, it's like an extra sense. It's like a sixth sense. And, and it resonates within us. But look at this, how strange that you have for one group Indifference. It didn't resonate with them at all. Hard, unprepared, no, no faith. The other, hard, the other group, whoa, whoa, wait, we want to know more. Now, we, 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 we've talked considerably here about the fact that the Holy Spirit is the one who empowers a witness, a Christian witness. Jesus said, Acts 1.8, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you'll be my witnesses. And, and, and we see all through the book of Acts the connection between the Holy Spirit empowering witness. Paul, not at this point in his life, but several years later, when he went to Corinth and then he wrote to the Corinthian church, he wrote this, I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. We get it. We understand that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So we understand that, that the Holy Spirit is the one. I mean, look at the, the, the great revivalists down through the history just of our nation. Think about Billy Graham. Billy Graham stands up to preach. There's power in his message, and you can tell, you can see it, you can sense it. And so we look for, we, we look for the power of God and the messenger of God. It makes sense. 
Again, Paul himself in Ephesians, when he was appealing to the believers in Ephesus to pray, he said, take the helmet of salvation, sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints, not just for me, but for all the saints and for me, that utterance may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Listen, if, if, if this is something we pray for, for, for boldness to speak and the ability to speak, well, then that, that's, that's important. And so on a given Sunday, we come to church, and the difference between indifference and hunger may have to do with the messenger. Right? If the messenger comes and, 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 and he's not empowered by the Spirit of the living God, it's probably going to be everybody going out with indifference. Everybody going, oh, that was a good message, Pastor. I mean, I mean, whoa, wait, wait. Nobody's saying, man, we want to hear more. Ah. But there's another part to this because Paul at this synagogue was filled with the Spirit. He did preach in the power of the Spirit, didn't he? So if he preached in the power of the Spirit and one group was just mildly curious and indifferent and another group was hungry for more, Oh, well that tells us that the ministry of the Holy Spirit is just as important in the heart and life of the hearer as it is in the life of the preacher. Oh. So, so, when, we, so when we come to church, I sure hope you pray that God will get a hold of the preacher. I sure hope you pray that the, that the Lord will light a fire under the preacher. But we also need to pray that God will light a fire under every one of us. So that this message will resonate with every one of us. So that we will not be able to come in here, sit here, take a snooze and walk out indifferent. Because what we do with God's Word matters forever. In our lives and in the lives of people we love. All right, next response we see here is opposition. What we do with God's word matters forever. Five responses. And, and uh, his third response we see Paul refers to as, or Luke refers to it, writing it down as opposition. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy. They didn't like it. And contradicting and blaspheming, they opposed the things spoken by Paul. Oh, I, Pastor, I would never, I would never oppose God's word. And they would have said that too. They would have said the same thing. But, but you know, opposing God's word isn't just what comes out of our mouth. Even though this word that, that's, that's used here, opposed, has the idea of speaking against something. But please understand that there are other ways that we can oppose. It doesn't have to be verbally. We don't have to say to someone, yeah, you, 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 you really don't want it. You really don't want to follow this book. We would never say that. Well, let me ask you something. Is it possible that by our lives we, make, we might make a statement like that? Well, certainly not intentionally. But opposition to God's Word might have to do with what we do with God's Word. If, if, if every day God's Word is like, you know, maybe not that important, then... then we may actually be voting not by what we say. We may be voting by our lives. We may be saying, you know what? This book just isn't that important to me. If, if, I, have to, um, if, if I have to somehow twist my arm behind my back to get myself to read this book, what am I saying? What statement am I making? I'm making a statement that says this book really doesn't matter. This is so 2,000 years ago. This book is so stale. It's so old or it becomes something that's so academic? Does this book have no bearing in how I live my life on a daily basis? Uh, I, I think that, that we ought to be having a real relationship with God because of this book. What do we read in Psalm 119? David says, your testimonies are wonderful. The last time you said... Man, when, is it, when was the last time you ever out of, come out of your mouth the words, this book is awesome, this book is wonderful? Can you think of a time? 
God's Word, is, it, is, this, is, this, is this like a, an old copy of Time magazine? Or is this God's Word, is it, is it alive and living and powerful? David says, your testimonies are wonderful. I mean, he had the Pentateuch. For crying out loud, I mean, he didn't have the great stuff that we have. And yet, your testimonies are wonderful, therefore my soul keeps them. The entrance of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. I opened my mouth and panted, for I longed for your commandments. Wow. Look, look upon me and be merciful to me as your custom is toward those who love your name. Direct my steps by your word and let no iniquity have dominion over me. He, the psalmist understood that, that, that this book changes everything when we get serious about it. But you see, this is on the opposite side from hunger. Indifference, opposition, this is the opposite of hunger. By the way, what's the greatest obstacle to hunger? Don't say death. I mean, obviously, if you're dead, you're not hungry anymore. Um, and if you're, if you're really sick, you're probably not hungry. But other than that, for healthy people, what's the greatest obstacle or thing that will keep you from being from hunger? Being full. You know, if you just had a, a huge uh, feast and somebody says, oh, come, come, come right now to my house and have a Thanksgiving dinner with me, you go, oof. Oh no, I'm gonna eat again. I can't, I'm full. And and I and I wonder as Christians if part of the reason that we have no hunger for God's word is because we're full. Full of what? Well, I, I don't know. That you know that. There are a lot of things that can fill us to where we have no hunger for God's word. Uh I, I don't know about you, but but um it's been a long time since I've watched a movie of any kind, but I find it hard to watch a movie anymore because it, it, it's so emotional. It's designed to suck you in and, and to grab your thoughts and burn itself into your memory. And I bet you everybody here that's watched a movie in the last year can call to your mind right now images from that movie. It's that powerful. Listen, when we're full of the, of the enemy's entertainment, we're not very hungry for God's Word. It doesn't have to be secular entertainment either. There's all kinds of things that can... Listen, uh, sometimes you have a project that you want to get done, whether it's today or this week, and it's, the project is dominating your thought and your heart, and it's in your mind, so much so that hunger for God's Word is just robbed. You're not hungry for God's Word. Have you ever had the experience to sit down and read the Bible? And you, you know, it's my morning devotion. You read the Bible, and you get all done. You put it down, and you go, hey, wait a minute. What did I just read? Can't remember a thing. What happened? No hunger for God's word. It's just uh, it's just uh, something the way, something they do at the at the at the synagogue on the Sabbath. They they read the Bible, they read a scripture passage, and okay, yeah, it's like magic. It's like magic. It's like um, it's like a little thing that we do to to keep from having problems. You know, if you know, it's like a good luck charm. For Christians, is that possible? Is it possible without realizing it that we have already moved in the direction of indifference and opposition without even realizing it? We would certainly never say to someone, I'm opposed to this book, but what does our life demonstrate? Hmm. Fourth response, rejection. Now, uh, once again, we would never, oh no, never go there. Now, really this rejection has the idea of repudiation, of of knowing something and saying, I'm not, I'm not going there anymore. I want nothing more to do with that. That's, that's the kind of rejection that's being described here, a rejection for God's Word. And you say, well, certainly, certainly that, that would not be true of any of us. Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said to these Jewish faithful at the synagogue, it was necessary that the Word of God should be spoken to you first, but since you reject it, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life. Hence, what we do with God's Word matters forever. Since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. Wow. Do we realize that probably very few people who know of God's Word and have heard God's Word start out with rejection as their first step? It starts generally with indifference, kind of, eh. I mean, indifference, and then that gradually transitions into opposition, and then gradually, I mean, not necessarily speaking out loud, but just gradually 
Every other activity is more important. Every other thing we do is a higher priority. And then finally comes rejection. I'm reminded uh, uh, in the, the Mahoney videos that we watched with regard to the Exodus and the timing of the Exodus, uh, patterns of evidence. One of the things that was interesting in the video is he, he, inter, he interviewed uh, several archaeologists, prominent archaeologists related to Israel and, and coming out of Egypt and all of that. Um, and he, as he interviewed them, he would ask them about what they believed. And, and um, it was very interesting because there was three prominent ones amongst them who all had been raised in a Christian home. They'd started out in Bible preaching homes by their own description where the, in their churches they believed the Bible to be the inerrant Word of God. And they took an interest in archaeology and studying about the, the children of Israel coming out of Egypt and so forth. And with time, as they went to the secular universities, they came to realize that, well, the secular archaeologists don't really believe that the Bible is accurate. So you don't really have to believe everything. And they became indifferent to God's Word. It just isn't all that important. And with time, they got to the point where Instead of just being indifferent, they actually began to be somewhat opposed. And when people say, well, well, wait a minute, that's not what the Bible says. Well, yeah, but it, it's, it, it, it may be a translation error, or it may be a, uh, you know, this error, or it may be that error. And before you know it, they were bringing opposition. But the sad part was, in the video, eventually Mahoney would ask them, so do you believe in the God of the Bible today? And they would say, no. You see, what happens, even for Christians, if we start with indifference and we move to opposition and eventually to rejection, we not only repudiate the Bible, we end up repudiating and rejecting the God of the Bible. Listen, what we do with God's Word matters forever for ourselves and for those around us. I know, I know. I don't believe that you can lose your salvation if you truly know Christ as your Savior. But I believe that there are many young people that grow up in our churches who have a cursory belief in God. And maybe they even raise their hand in VBS, and maybe they even got baptized. And maybe they even become a member of the church, and maybe even a deacon, I don't know. And yet, something's not quite solid there in terms of their faith. Listen, if, if God's Word, if you find God's Word to be boring or a chore, or something you do because you have to do. Or you, you might want to stop and think about whether you truly know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Listen, this book is not boring. If it's boring, it's because something's missing in you. That sense of appreciation for God's Word is lacking. Something's not right. Reject, indifference, opposition, rejection. But thankfully... We're going to find one more response. But before we do, Paul says, Since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. Wow! The rejection of God's Word leads in that direction. Now in Hebrews, we find this. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. You know, it's one thing for a person that um, didn't know the Lord as their Savior, grew up in the world, practiced... I mean, the Apostle Paul himself was a murderer, right? But when he's saved and born again, he's transformed by the power of the Gospel, his life changed. But it's something quite different when a person grows up in the Gospel and, and uh, is in church and, and understands all these things and puts even a, a, a sign of faith and then turns and walks out the door so we have this testimony in Hebrews 10. If we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain, certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour, devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law, Old Testament, dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified, a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace. 
For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Listen, I'm here to lovingly challenge every one of us. Indifference to this book, opposition to this book, rejection to this book is not an option for those who claim to know Christ as Lord and Savior. And when we get careless about the importance of God's Word in our lives, watch out! Not, not, not good. Listen, uh, our, our young people today are facing temptations like we cannot imagine. Thankfully, our kids are all grown and are raising kids of their own. Um, parents today, raising your children, your preteen and teenage children, Please count on the fact they will be exposed to pornography. No exceptions. They already have been. They're being bombarded with it. Listen, if, if, if our children have not uh, developed a hunger for God's Word, we're in trouble because the temptation is so strong and we had better be a rock-solid pillar of, of strength for them. And... The number of Christian fathers and Christian mothers who have, who have allowed themselves to be sucked in by secular entertainment and watch movies that they have no business watching and who allow themselves to, to feast their eyes on filth on the internet, you cannot expect that you're going to have a positive impact on your child for eternity. May God get a hold of our hearts. If we find God's Word to be boring, then watch your children go to hell. Is that strong? That's not strong enough. Brethren, we've got to get serious. Listen, what we do with God's Word matters forever for ourselves and for those around us and those we love because they can read us like a book. We're not fooling them. We have got to make God's Word a critical part of our thinking, our lives. Let God's Word transform us. And if it's just something we do as a chore or it's just something that happens on Sunday, brethren... We're in trouble. So the fifth response I find so interesting. Um, I, I had a hard time putting the, doing this outline, but I soon realized that indifference, opposition, rejection, hunger, glorification. You say, glorification? How are we going to glorify God's Word? Pastor, are you making up stuff again? No. Stay with me a minute because it's, it, this wasn't my idea. This was, um, this was Paul's idea, or at least Luke's idea, recording it. Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first, but since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, I have set you as a light to the Gentiles, that you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. Now when the Gentiles heard this, there we go, they were glad and they glorified the word of the Lord. What? How are you supposed to do that? How can you glorify the word of the Lord? Well, the word glorify just means to, to speak well of it. To, to speak about God's word in such a way that you're, you, you say, this book is awesome. This book will change your life. This book will lead to eternal life in Jesus Christ. Are you kidding me? This book is amazing. And so these Gentiles, they heard and they were glad and they glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed and the word of the Lord was being spread throughout all the region. They glorified God's word. Wow. When was the last time I glorified God's word? When was the last time that to anyone I spoke in high and eloquent terms that this book is amazing? You know, it, 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 can you remember when, when uh, the priests were told by Josiah to go in and clean up the temple and they went in and they come back and the guy says, um, uh, they're doing the work and uh, everything's going pretty well and uh, by the way, they found a book. What? Shaphan found the book. Says, they found the book. Shaphan says, um, would you like me to read some of this book that we found in the temple? Yeah. And they start reading and they find out the book of the law, the book of what God had commanded them had been lost in the temple. They had forgotten God's word in the temple of all places. And as Shaphan began to read the book of the law, the king tore his clothes and said, Oh, God, be merciful to us. We're going to fall under his judgment because we've been disobedient to this book. <laughs> oh, may God get a hold of our hearts to realize this is not just a 
Aesop's fable. This is God's word. And it's living and powerful. And yes, it makes a difference in our lives, but not if it's laying on the shelf. What we do with God's word matters forever for ourselves, for those around us. <sighs> you know, uh, most of us make investments for our retirement years. You know, but that's a good thing. You know, you, you work and you save and you set aside some, some resources so that the, the last 20, 30, 40 years of your life, whatever it is, you'll have something there to, to, to go, go on. And we all think that's a good idea. This is forever. This isn't for 30, 40, 50, 100, 1,000 years. This is forever. The, what we do with this book affects forever for us, for those we love. What we do with God's Word matters forever. Indifference leads to opposition and rejection, but hunger, hunger for God's Word leads to glorification to where we, we become so excited and thrilled about God's Word that we've got to tell somebody. It, it, it's got to spill out of us like water out of a fountain. When, they, when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and they glorified the Word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed, and the Word of the Lord was being spread all over the place. <laughs> right? These people couldn't keep quiet about God's Word. I wonder if the reason that the Word of God is not spreading all over the place in America is because God's people have forgotten how to glorify His Word. We've become apathetic, indifferent about God's Word so that God's Word... Listen, if God's Word does not mess with my life, if God's Word does not get me excited about my walk with God, then why would I share it with anyone else? May God get a hold of our hearts to realize this book is pure gold. There's nothing more important for our lives. And asking the Spirit of God to open our hearts to receive it and, and to get excited about it. And look what it says. And as many as have been appointed to eternal life believed. So, in other words, when these people got excited about God's Word and began speaking about it, people heard, those who had been called to eternal life, and they said, oh, I want that. And people started turning to faith in Christ. I suspect that when God's people get excited about God's Word, have a hunger for God's Word, and begin to glorify God's Word, begin to speak highly of God's Word, there's an effect that will... Not everybody gets saved. Not, if, not even for Paul, right? He preached and some people were indifferent and, and rejected it. But others... They came alive, they had hunger, and they began to glorify God's Word and speak highly of it. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy... You know what's funny about this? That's even while in the verses right before it says they were persecuting Paul and they kicked him out of their country and, and there's all this persecution against the new believers. They didn't even care. They were so filled with joy of salvation that they didn't even worry about persecution. Isn't that funny? Wow. I want some of that. Jesus said, He who believes in me, as the Scripture said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. May I ask you something? When was the last time that rivers of living water flowed out of your heart with the love and the power of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit? What we do with God's Word is incredibly important. And if, if our heart and our life and our walk with God has gone so flat that God's Word doesn't even resonate, it's as if we've gotten spiritual COVID. You know, COVID, you know, the flu doesn't take away your smell and your, and, and your sense of smell and taste. COVID does. That's one of the few things that's dis unique to COVID is the loss of smell and taste. Um, I'm wondering if we've got a case of spiritual COVID. Have we lost our sensitivity to the Word of God that where we can sit down and read it and say, I did my job, I read a couple verses, I read a paragraph, I read a chapter, or even I'm reading through the Bible in a year, and oh boy, I race through and read, 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 and I get it all done, close it, and somebody five minutes later said, what did you just read? And you say, I don't know. 
Well, if that's the case, I guarantee you will not be glorifying the Word of God for that reading. It's just sort of, you know, stuff. Wow, this is God's Word, isn't it? May God give us a hunger for His Word. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and they glorified the Word of the Lord and as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. You see why? What we do with God's Word matters forever because the people around us are exposed to the power of God when we come alive, when we get a fire lit under us about God's Word and about His Spirit working in and through us. And when we're passive and and apathetic and indifferent, nothing happens. And they march right on their path towards eternal judgment. I don't think any of us want that. The people we know and love, So we need to pray that God will get a hold of our hearts with regard to God's Word. That we will come to value God's Word. That that we will realize what we do with it matters. And we vote. Go vote. If you haven't voted already, please go vote. But remember that every day we vote when it comes to God's Word. And just like our voting for the president has consequences for the next four years or eight or whatever it is, Our vote with regards to this book has consequences that last forever. Think about that. Go vote every day. Vote by valuing this book and saying, God, please open my heart to receive your message. Don't let me fall asleep while I'm reading this book. This is the most, it's like reading a treasure map. So uh, as we close, um, just give a a moment of opportunity for you right where you are just to stop and in your heart decide what are you going to do with what you've heard today. If you're indifferent, you're going to do nothing. But if you desire to be used of God to have an impact in the lives of people around you, would you at least Ask God to light your heart on fire when it comes to His Word. Would you at least in your heart say, God, please give me a hunger for Your Word and, and, and teach me to speak well of Your Word in the, to the people I come into contact with. And Heavenly Father, please help me every day to start my day with an absolute devotion to spending time in Your Word and change me from the inside out. That's what God's Word does. It not only matters in this lifetime, as we saw in Sunday school, but it matters forever. So before we sing our song, I I, I challenge you to invite you right now, quietly in your own heart before God. Say, your own choice. Lord, where am I going with this? What needs to change in my life? Like to stand as we sing. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. When I feel a
Father, we just uh, thank you for today, and we thank you for your word, Lord. Help us not to take it lightly, and that we lift it up and show others your light, and uh, make it our, the light to our feet so that we can walk in this dark world, but that we see your glory and your light, Lord. We just uh, thank you for all the words that were spoken today, and let us take that into our heart and take it home with us. And... Uh, Lord, we just, we love you, and we bless you, and we thank you for this beautiful day, and in Jesus' name, amen.